how it works and, and how to use it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the past in the past, we've kind of been trying to do most of the underwriting because it's a it's a deal by deal basis and not everything's so black and white. But also, I think it's important to have a better understanding of how to underwrite deals, because when you're talking to agents and sellers, you'll have a better understanding of where you need to be with the numbers and the conversation will just feel more natural because when you're talking to them about it, you should have a general idea of where you need to be. Yeah, definitely. And then also too, in terms of if you think something should be submitted or not, because I feel like there's some people that aren't submitting things because they're not a hundred percent sure. And then I also feel like there's other people who are like submitting everything where it's not really a deal. And I think this calculator will definitely really help a lot in terms of deciphering what could potentially be a solid deal and what very, has a very low probability of actually being a deal. All right. And so I'm going to go over how I underwrite a subject to deal. And then I'll also go over how I underwrite a seller finance deal. And when I do my underwriting, my initial underwriting, um, it's not super important on having like the super in-depth understanding of where you need to be. And it's okay if the numbers are wrong at the beginning, because after that initial conversation, you'll have a better understanding of what the offer needs to be like to make the seller accept it. Okay. So to start, I have an address already picked out. So this one's contingent. So it's not even available, but I have the details for it. So I just thought it's like a real example we could use. And let me pull up. What the, that's so weird. Um, shoot. Was anyone else, else having this problem? Let me try it over. It's not allowing you to edit it or? Yeah, but let me let me try it. Okay. And as I'm underwriting, please ask questions because I want to clarify, try to keep, make this like as clear as possible so that going forward, not only are you making the calls, you also could be looking at the deal, which isn't my favorite part, but I do enjoy doing it sometimes. Um, okay, so here's a detail for this deal. And so I'm going to pull up the address just so everyone can paint the picture better. It's a 3-3 in Arizona. Okay, so it's near a major city. Um, I always look at the location is one of the first things I, I want to know because if it's in the middle of nowhere, not that this is in the middle of nowhere, but this is less populated when looking at Tucson. And so knowing that that means it's like a it's like a B tier market. So people aren't really gonna be buying over here as heavily as like a major city. And so now that I look at that, then I also hmm. I'm also going to look at Rentcast. This is a fast way to find what the rental comps should be. This is not ever 100% accurate, but when you're doing quick underwriting, this is a great way to get in a, a better idea or even asking the agent what they think they could rent it for is another question that you could be asking when you're on the phone. 
And so this one's showing 1950. And going back to the spreadsheet, the monthly payment is 2300. So this deal does not cash flow. Because two two nine one minus uh, nineteen fifty equals I don't know. Or I'm sorry, I think I'm doing it backwards. I think you put this number in front. Yeah, and then the other thing to consider too is even if say it equaled out when you're subtracting the monthly payment from what the rent is and it was almost zero, you still have to factor in usually 10, 15. Some people shoot for 20% more conservative um, for, for CapEx, you know, maintenance, vacancies, property management, things like that. So even if the numbers look break even, I would always still factor in another couple hundred bucks for uh, what I just stated. And so this, as a long-term rental, which is always how you're going to want to analyze these deals, it doesn't cash flow. But what's great about real estate is not everyone is buying to make it a long-term rental. There's several different exit strategies. And so just because it doesn't cash flow as a long-term rental doesn't mean there's a play there. And so just looking at this, because it doesn't cash flow, that means I, I know I'm going to want to be around 5% with my total entry cost. And that's 5% um, of the purchase price. So you do 0 0.05 for 5% and then you multiply it times the asking price. And so that means that ideally I want my entry to be around here, which is but five percent of purchase price. And then one thing to mention just briefly too is, and of course it's never black and white like we always say, because there's like one deal we sent a contract out on yesterday, 2.6% interest rate, brand new build in Colorado, break even as a long-term rental. Um, but it's right next to an airport and doesn't have HOA. And the interest rate's 2.6%. So you're getting massive principal pay down. And this one here, the interest rate's pretty solid, 3.5. I did notice, Alex, when you were on the Zillow listing, it said no HOA. But this location of this place, I know, isn't like the Colorado one we had. Because, um, shoot, I'm going to butcher the heck out of that city. And I've heard it before and I should know how to say it. But so, <laughs> how, do, how do you say it? I think it's Sarita. Okay. So there, I know it's more of like a, a B area away from, from Tucson. So I couldn't really see a bunch of people wanting to do Airbnb there or midterm or anything like that. Um, I could be wrong, though, but I haven't really looked into that market too much um, or that specific location of this one. But like Alex said, on this one, it's probably just going to be only really going to work as a long-term rental. I guess someone could theoretically wrap it. But if a wrap is only, your only exit, you would still need to be around that 5% entry there. But uh that's one thing to mention in terms of like the kind of gray area, black and white. Like if we saw a really nice brand new build and more of an A market with a low interest rate and it looked like a break even, then there could be, you know, a little wiggle room on that, on that entry. Just wanted to mention that real quick. Thanks. And then, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in and. Uh... I have a question, Heather. Um, at one point, I think you guys were saying you wanted to be in a 10% entry. Did that shift or is it 5% specifically because this property doesn't cash flow and it's um, predominantly in a, in a um, traditional rental yeah, area? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so general rule of thumb, we've always kind of said, and, and that's kind of generally everyone's buy box in sub two, 10% entry or less, 5% interest rate or less. There's always kind of exceptions to that rule and this is kind of more of an exception where it's bleeding is a long-term rental it's not in a super super sought after great area and there's not really an exit for it other than maybe a wrap or someone just holding a long-term rental that's gonna bleed money for the next three to five years until rents rise so yeah okay so 
what's the value in it if it is a cash flow? Sorry, what was that, Heather? Your your audio was cutting out a little bit there. Sorry. I was wondering, what is the value in it if it doesn't cash flow? Well, the value in it is you could be getting, well, so basically with this one, you could wrap. So if you're getting a really low entry fee of around 5% and the interest rate's 3.5%, I could theoretically take this over sub two and offer to sell or finance it to someone who doesn't have good credit and couldn't qualify for traditional financing. So that's one exit that you could actually cash flow on. Um, like I said, I have no clue on the short-term rental or mid-term potential of this one in that area. Um, and that will take a little bit of time to, to look into that. Um, but in terms of a long-term rental, someone could totally just buy this and say, hey, I'm getting a 2000, I think it was a 2008. So somewhat newer build, not old build, decent house in a decent area with a low interest rate. That's going to give me good principal pay down okay, I'm only coming out of pocket $17,000 to buy this property that has a 3% interest rate. So that's the value in that where someone will say, you know what, I'll bleed $500 a month for the next three to five years until kind of rents rise a bit to at least me being a break even. I'll still get that principal pay down. I'll get the depreciation. That's kind of the value there that investors see in deals like that. So it wouldn't make sense for someone to come out of pocket 30, 40 grand on this one. But um, if you're getting closer to that 5% range, then it would be a lot more appealing to somebody. Okay, got it. Even though that exit strategy isn't going to be putting money in their pocket instantly. Yeah. Oops. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Yvette. Um, I wanted to, could you explain to me a little bit um, more um, the wrapping process? Like when you buy a property and you, you get wrapped, can you explain that a little bit more detail for me? So, sorry, your, your, um, your audio, your mic's cutting out a lot there. I'm a static. Just, she said something uh, about a wrap, right? Yeah, I think just kind of explaining the whole process of what it looks like. The process. Like yeah. So in terms of what the wrap essentially is, so a lot of people do this strategy where they'll take over an existing note, whether that's sub two or seller finance, most of the time it's going to be sub two. And then they, so they take over the existing payments. So in this case, I would take over the 3.5% interest rate loan. And I would then market that property to an end buyer who couldn't qualify for traditional financing. So I would post it on do you Alex do you have that verbiage that you could show maybe I guess just to to help like that old Buckeye listing maybe is that still up with that verbiage uh, J just describing I mean just for an example well anyway like I you don't can, I don't oh, yeah. yeah no worries you can post these on the MLS or actually Alex can you search 801 Royal Ave 801 yeah 801 yeah that one the pictures are so good man yeah, no, the pictures are sick. It's just not freaking selling. We're probably just going to keep it as a rental. Um, But could you back out of that and just scroll to the, uh, yeah, that verbiage. So that's pretty much what yours was. So essentially on there, I took over this property sub two. It's like a 2%, 2.67% interest rate loan. And basically owner financing deals, specific financing terms can be discussed and designed to fit buyer circumstances and preferences, manageable down payment and competitive interest rates. So Essentially, what I did there is I took over that low interest rate loan sub two. And what I'm trying to do now is I'm going to owner finance it to an end buyer who ideally comes with enough of a down payment that would cover pretty much all my entry fee or close to my entry fee that I paid to get this house. And then I'm going to be wrapping it at an interest rate. It's not, I wouldn't say the interest rate is competitive here with this verbiage because the house is cheap. So this house is worth like 150, 160. Um, a little more actually, but it's it's not the market's telling us otherwise. But basically me wrapping a hundred forty, hundred fifty thousand dollar balance after subtracting their down payment is going to be um a, a low principal amount. So me having a twelve percent interest rate on it is really like not too noticeable. So me wrapping it twelve percent interest rate, that's like a seventeen hundred dollar a month payment roughly, which is like five hundred over what that thing could rent for. So essentially, my loan that I took over sub to, it's like a $700 a month payment. Their payment, when I wrap it 
or basically owner finance it out at a higher interest rate is going to be closer to $1,700. So I'm basically just a bank. I'm a note holder and I'm financing the house to them basically wrapped around the existing note that I took over. So there's like a thousand dollar a month spread there that I would just be making passively without having to worry about tenants, maintenance, vacancy, anything like that. Um, because they're theoretically okay. buying the house off of me and I'm just like the bank financing it to them. So that's a really lucrative strategy that people like where they'll take over existing loans, whether it's sub two or seller finance, and then they just do a wrap on that existing loan and they sell it at a higher purchase price and a higher interest rate and just collect the spread like a bank. Thank you. Yeah. But there are downsides to it. Like a lot of people started getting into it and a lot of people are not moving properties where they thought they would and kind of like mine, but at least mine, I, it, it works as a rental. It works as a rental. So if we don't find a rat buyer, I know this time of year is horrible too for, for moving houses just with the holidays. So I'm like, you know, we'll give it another two months. And if not, we'll just keep it as a rental and cash flow, three or 400 bucks a month. Because that is kind of like a, a niche, not super niche, but it is a little bit of a niche buyer. You know, someone who doesn't qualify traditionally, has bad credit, is looking to be financed through an individual rather than a bank. But still a lot of people do it. All right. And so just kind of going back to this, I'm trying to fill in the information, just looking at it from a long-term rental perspective. If we were to do that 1950 find someone for 1950 after factoring capex and repairs and vacancy this gets you at a cash flow of negative 731 dollars which is pretty pretty bad so like as a long-term rental this is not going to work at all and so that's why you need to explore the midterm rental short-term rental um, wrap different exit strategies because this wouldn't work. And when you're looking at it from a long-term rental perspective, you have to remember over time, rent, rent, uh, monthly rent will increase. And so just because it's not cash flowing today, it doesn't mean it's going to like not cash flow in two years. Yeah. And there's also Section 8, which I forgot to mention, which is another really strong exit strategy that I think Jack and I will be using a lot going forward. And what's nice about it is you're helping people and not everyone is going to trash a place. Um, you could still find some pretty good people when when renting out to Section 8. Can you explain Section 8 in a little more detail? Sure. So it just fund. It's partially funded by the government, so that you know you're getting a consistent amount of the rent coming in monthly. And the government basically gives individuals like a voucher, I believe is what they call it, and then they just kind of shop on the affordable housing website of, of available rent and go from there yeah and that's something alex and i haven't really done much of yet you can you can see rough estimates of what section 8 pays in certain areas and oftentimes it's higher than what the long-term rental rate is and i mean i've always heard mixed things about section 8 but now i feel like um i think pace does section 8 yeah um now i'm hearing more positive things than i kind of the few negative horror stories I heard. So typically Section 8 is, is people who um, are just struggling financially and are getting help from the government for, for housing, essentially. And I've heard stories of like, oh, the house was trash. They didn't take care of it, blah, blah, blah. Because essentially, not like people are getting free housing, but sometimes they are. It really just depends how much the government's covering. So then there's kind of less skin in the game or likelihood of them to take care of it is just what the general census is, is from what I've heard. But then at the same time, I've talked to a lot of people that actually do Section 8 at scale, and they tell me that these people have vouchers and they can lose their, um, basically their, their vouchers for Section 8 if they trash the place or don't take care of it. So some of these people are actually taking better care of the houses on Section 8 than you would just get with a normal tenant because basically these people are, are very you know grateful of 
getting their rent paid, well, a substantial amount paid by the government. So they don't want to lose that because then they'll be out on the streets and won't be able to afford renting a place themselves. So a lot of people are actually like taking better care of Section 8s than other rentals. So that's something I've heard from people that are doing it a volume. And I'm like, you know what? This is something we actually got to start doing because some of these houses really cheap in the Midwest, we can get them and, and um, buy them literally cash DSCR, cash out refi, Section 8, and probably still cash flow. Um, so, I mean, I know we like the creative stuff, seeing 3%, 2% interest rates. But, I mean, shoot, if you can still get a free house with an 8% interest rate and cash flow, it could be a really good strategy too. So, something we're definitely planning on looking into more and, and doing in the next couple of months. And, uh, yeah, Bertha, I don't know if you want to share that, your experience. You said it so far, it's going really good, running to Section 8. Hi. Yeah, I, I actually have two houses I rented to Section 8. And I did take a class. I, if, uh, there's one investor that does it a lot. So I kind of follow what he does. So the, the, the more they pay depends on the zip code and... Uh -huh. And the room number. So the more rooms that you have, the better the rent that they will give you. And he did go over like he very. It's uh, it's very important to, to choose your your tenant. So it's like the the job that you have to do finding the right tenant. It's as the most important thing I think out of the the renting to section eight. So your job really has to be going through the doing your due diligence. Uh, so like background check, what the one thing that I think it's very important when you choose a tenant for section eight, like you go to their house and see how they know their house. So if it's trash, whatever you go, you're like, you know that that's how your house is going to be. Yeah. So when I, when we went, when we chose the tenant, we went to their houses and um, the one that we have, their, their houses were, were like well kept. The, the kids were very um they were not like running around or things like that so that's that's the ones that we chose and so far it's been it's been great awesome but then yeah I, I like it i like it they get to they pay part of the the rent and the government does the rest so awesome. so far so good yeah i like it cool thanks for sharing that you're welcome um then also looks like sandra's had a good experience with that josh said some good info too Awesome. Yeah, no, it's definitely something that um, I wouldn't say I've been ignorant to, but there's just so many different things. Multifamily, Section A, this, this, this. It's like, okay, like let's let's master certain sections before we dive into other sections. And Section 8 is definitely the next thing we really want to step into. And then multifamily after that. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. I know there's a lot of investors that strictly do Section 8. Yeah. Um, just finding your niche and whatever makes you feel the best doing is what I would go with and I mean Jack and I have talked about it just it it you're doing good and you're also being protected by the government which is amazing uh so it really just depends on the zip code Nancy when looking at if the section 8 uh rents are higher in that area like uh i believe bertha said zip code and bed count is what they look at and then just kind of going back to this deal does anyone have any questions i feel like i kind of justified why on this one we might even need to be closer to like four percent of the purchase price which would be i could get the exact calculation but i'm sure it'd be somewhere around fifteen thousand, which is going to be really hard because this is an on-market property. And so just giving 3% to the agent is basically... So like this deal, you would probably have to give the seller $0 at closing. And because there's a spread between the loan balance and the purchase price, they may need to carry some, but it just like, this may just not even be a deal because after factoring in that seller finance portion, whether it's a hundred bucks, 200 bucks would be really, really bad. But even a hundred bucks sounds like it would uh, just make the monthly payment go up. 
So yeah, and then it, it, yeah, who knows too, Alex? Because that's not. I don't know the size of that city. I remember, if I recall correctly, on the map, it's not in too. Can you go to the map actually and kind of zoom out a bit? Because I I don't think it's too close to Tucson. Maybe like a twenty minute drive or something, or is it farther? Oh yeah, it's farther. It's probably yes, like thirty it's minutes. a it's a thirty minute drive. Thirty. Yeah, Yeah. so something like that, you probably couldn't really pad split there. I don't know if that's. I don't think it has enough of a metropolitan I area. I don't see anyone doing a short term rental there. Um, and this is me just being ignorant, right? I haven't. dove in deeply into that city but i don't see anyone doing a short-term rental mid-term rental or pad split there so that's probably something like alex was saying you know you may even have to be lower than five percent interest um i mean not interest sorry entry fee but um you know i think with it being a nicer newer build though there's there's potential to to find a rat buyer on that too especially with the location as well So uh I have a question then. yeah So what's up I live in, I, I used to live in Saudi. It's growing a lot. A lot of families are moving down here and they're building a lot of uh, schools and it's by a hospital and they really need like a lot of, uh, um, they're understaffed. So would a midterm rental work there for like nurses and stuff? That that could definitely be a potential. Um, I mean, one thing to to do would be to go on that map again, see where this house is exactly located, and seeing how far away it is from potentially a hospital. Um, I There's don't a hospital think. right there on the exit of getting into Saurita, so there is one right there. That's the one that's understaffed. So, um, but like So I said, pretty, it, it, it's growing pretty close. quite. Yeah, it could work. It could Yeah. work. Definitely want to do. I I try calling the hospital and see whether they are bringing in traveling nurses. Yeah. And also, when you're looking at that midterm with the traveling nurses, um, make sure that they're actually. Uh, she, you muted yourself. I don't know if something happened. She may have intentionally muted your, your, you're muted, Laura. I don't know if you intentionally did that or not though. Also, I like the, the picture of the, uh, <laughs> the alligator Santa. I was looking at that. <laughs> Sorry, can you tell him Gator? There you go. Oh, okay. Um, I get it. I get it. Gator, it makes sense. yeah, That's yeah, cool. please get it. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm in track. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. Um, the uh, on the midterm rental, make sure that you call in and see whether or not there's a nursing school in town, um, because that makes a difference if you're not in a big metro area. Anybody with an, any place with a nursing school in town will not be bringing in traveling nurses. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That's Thank good you. to know. Thanks. And I mean, one thing Good too, that's horn. gotcha. One thing too, that's super interesting. If someone, so it sounds like you've done a bit of the midterm rental stuff, Laura, which is awesome. And then some other people sound like they've specialized in, and done a decent amount of section eight. If anyone wants to, Um, cause we were going to bring someone on today and then they kind of like flaked. So they're going to come on next weekend, but we're trying to have a guest every other Saturday or something like that. But if anyone feels like they have a decent amount of experience or knowledge within midterm rentals, renting to travel nurses or, or section eight, things like that. And they wanted to share like a 15, 20 minute segment or something like that. I think that'd be awesome. And everyone would find it valuable. Um, because that's something that isn't Alex and I's super strong suit. Um, so it'd also be cool and a learning experience for everyone. So if, if any of you are interested in doing that, um, I mean, you could throw a message in the chat now or, or text Alex or I, or message us on discord and it'd be cool to set something up like that. Wouldn't you agree, Alex? I don't want to speak. Yes. Yeah. Send us the text and, uh, Yeah. we'll try to work something out. And then Cool. Cool. just r briefly, I want to analyze this deal. If it was free and clear, just because when you're looking at seller finance deals and subject to deals they're going to be different Yeah. And a lot of people will ask that question too. Like when something's owned free and clear, like, like Jack, this, okay, well, here's like what our cash wholesale offer be, but if they don't accept that. Like, where do I even start for a seller finance offer? And ideally, like you never want to, since sorry, I'm kind of jumping the gun before showing numbers, but like, ideally you never want to just say, okay, well, roughly let's do it like a 10% entry fee and let's try to make it as good as possible. Like you probably want to start at, depending on their situation and the motivation, um, you can kind of play it and see where you should start, but you don't want to be starting at like 10% down. I'd probably be starting at like 3% down and seeing, 
you know, if they had a tenant in place, how much they were cash flowing with the tenant and trying to get close to that cash flow um, with my monthly payment I'd make to them on a seller finance. Um, it could be, I've heard stories before of like an older couple where they're saying, I just want $400 or whatever, $400, $600 a month to take care of this expense, this property. I've been losing money on it now recently with the repairs and the tenants not paying. And I just want to be done with it. And like a situation like that, if you heard that kind of motivation, you could literally say, well, hey, I don't want you to worry about this. This sounds like just a big mess. I don't want you dealing with this. What if I match the $400, $500 a month that you were making, like you had a tenant in place, and I just came in and I paid you monthly for for the property, and you would get paid um, whatever for the next 30 years. Um, depending on the purchase price, there could be a balloon payout in 30 years or whatever. Um, and you wouldn't have to worry about evicting these tenants and doing those repairs if I just came in and and paid you monthly. And some people would be all over that depending on their motivation and their situation. That's a very rare, small percentile of the time though. Most of the time, like someone's ideally trying to get 10 to 20% down. They're trying to match the current market, market interest rate, but there's always like kind of levers you can play with to try to get um, the numbers in your favor. Like if someone's like, well, I want 10% down. Okay, well, if we're doing that, I need to be cash flowing somewhat heavily as a rental. So then I'm going to be here with quote unquote, the interest or my monthly payment. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that quick before we dove into that. My bad. <laughs> no, thanks, man. Thanks. And then, so just going back to this, the homes listed at 344 on a seller finance deal, it's hard to get it at a discount. Like Jack said, it's never a good idea to give your max and best to start, but I would say being probably at like 90% of it is where I like to be just so I'm not like wasting time. Like I want to give a strong offer, but at the same time, um, give myself a wiggle room because the better did the better the deal, the better for me. Yeah. And sorry, I just want to chime in and add one thing there. So there's scenarios like I agree, like with Alex, like with a lot of these direct to agent sort of deals, when there's a bunch of other offers coming in and it's competitive, we want to be not starting with our max allowable offer, but kind of in that range, like, you know, whatever, 70 to 90% where it's kind of tight. But like I said, if you're getting that person who the motivation is just through the roof, um, this is more of like direct to seller stuff because you're not having a middleman and you're actually connecting with them and having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. If that motivation is through the roof, you can literally like start with something where you're giving like zero down. It really just depends. But a lot of the time, like if I'm speaking with, you can just tell like some of these people, well, I have these rental properties. I need at least this. I'm not doing anything else. Like that person in my mind, I'm already knowing I'm not going to offend them with the 1% or 2% down and 0% interest. And, you know, I'm going to kind of come up a bit, but it's important to never start with your max allowable offer though, or your MAO, because if you're starting with your MAO, 99% of the time, a seller's never going to accept your first offer. They're going to counter. So if you're starting like with one of the general wholesaler form wholesale formulas of like 70% ARV minus repairs or 10% entry on a sub two. If you're starting pitching that stuff, almost all the time there's going to be a counter and then you can't counter and come up higher because you started at your max allowable offer. So that's something like you never want to do starting at the max allowable offer. But Alex and I were usually starting kind of at that sweet spot, a decent ways below it, but not so low where it's offensive and we're going to get ghosted by an agent. Exactly. And so just kind of playing around. Ooh, this will be fun. So looking at this deal, we're, let's just say we pay asking price on a seller fin finance deal that's free and clear. And I just want to mention, be, even though it's free and clear, you're still making payments. And that's it. that's for taxes and insurance, which in Arizona, it's not that bad. But in some states, maybe like Florida and Texas, it might be kind of bad. But if you're doing a wrap where as the investor, you're only paying for principal and interest, and then you have the end buyer paying for taxes and insurance. That's why people like to do wraps in Texas. But just going back to this, I use this website a lot when trying to figure out hybrid deals and um, just seller finance deals. And so the purchase price, let's say we only give them, 
what do you want to do jack do you want to be like let's be very low down like yeah let's only um, ten thousand. so let's do yeah. three four and this okay. let's say this is a good place to start let's just say this is a family that if they sold it oh wait we're we're assuming that this is owned free and clear right exactly yeah okay. but, but it's in gotcha. um maybe probate or something okay Gotcha. So they don't really, really need money, and we could kind of sell them on, hey, monthly paychecks. Oops. Oh, boy. What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> You're having a me moment, dude. Zoomer. Zoomer. All right. Okay, so just looking at this, I know I can't do 6% interest rate. Um, honestly, one thing I want to mention too, is just like with seller finance deals that I've done before, I never even mentioned interest rate. And it's funny because like some of these have gotten so close to the finish line and then their attorneys reviewing the contract and then she's like, well, interest, like it's, it's been funny, but, oh, well, we're talking interest rate. Well, I was, you know, I was going to give you, we were giving you 10% down and, and we have a balloon in 15 years. So we were just assuming we were just doing principal only payments. So if you want an interest rate, we need to go back and completely restructure the entire deal because we agreed upon the $500 payments that I was making to you. So a lot of times, if you just tell someone a number, like you could kind of plug it in like a calculator like this, but say if you put zero, Alex, what would that be? Maybe like $800 a month? Yeah. Oops. Oh my God. Does it not allow zero? Oh, there we go. 900. $900 a month payment. So if I told them, hey, if I paid you $920 a month, that might sound appealing to someone. They'd be like, oh, 900 bucks a month? This is great. But if you're telling someone, hey, well, okay, we're going to start at 2% interest, then they instantly in their brain, they're like, what the what the F? 2% interest rates currently are closer to 8%. I want 8%. Um, so I've noticed like in the past, like when, when we're pitching the seller finance stuff, we haven't got a ton of seller finance stuff because we've mainly been direct to agent, low equity sub too. But as we're doing a lot more cash stuff now, we're going to start doing this a lot more. We don't really want to be bringing up interest rate at all unless it's being brought up to us because someone's always going to shoot for that closer to market rate, which hopefully rates are slowly starting to come down. And, you know, us pitching a three or 4% interest rate is a lot easier to swallow right now then it would be when rates are well, rates haven't dropped substantially, but you know, if rates are currently around eight and we're pitching half of that, some people are, you know, are going to want more. So I usually don't like to bring up interest rate at all, unless it gets brought up to me. I usually like to just get a principal only payment and I don't say principal only. I just say monthly payment of X, whatever it is. And then, uh, then you have little levers and components you can play with to still make an offer work for you, whether it's the down payment, some sort of balloon payment amount, the interest rate, the overall purchase price. Because I've heard of people who've bought seller finance deals that are paying like 150% of market value, but they're getting them with like no money down and the monthly payment allows for cash flow. So some people don't care. Just wanted to add that real quick. And um, what's cool about seller finance deals is there's different levers to pull. So let's say they're like, nope, I'm stuck on 5% interest. If you're not giving me that, I don't want to talk to you. Okay. That's fine. But I want it. Oops. Let me do this. I want it with a 40-year schedule. And so let's see what that makes our monthly payment. 16. And so just kind of going back to this, I was playing with the numbers. And let's say this was direct to seller. So it's not even listed. You're like, hey, I'll give you 10K now. I'll pay for closing. And this is a home run. Like, this is a good deal if this happens. But you factor in taxes and insurance, the monthly payment. This was 0% interest over 30 years. Gets you to a monthly payment of 1117 And if the monthly rent rate is 1950 even with a 20% CapEx, you're cash flowing 443 bucks and you're only in the deal 14,000. And it, let's just say you wanted to assign this. You could probably assign this, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20K, maybe even more. 
because it's a seller finance deal because so there's no due on sale clause so this is just overall a safer bet for most investors in the long term also with seller finance deals you never want to bring up a balloon just like you never want to bring up interest but unless they're savvy if they're a savvy investor and you're most likely not going to get a super great deal anyway so letting them know hey you can make interest on the money that you financed to me um, could be another selling point but yeah just kind of going back to this if they were set on the five percent interest you might need to make it over 40 years or 50 years no Oh, it doesn't let me set it for 50 years. But it would probably be around 1200 So maybe you're not cash flowing as heavily, but you're still getting a really great deal. Yeah, and like Alex said too, with savvy investors, it always gets more tricky. Or not savvy investors, savvy sellers. Like that North Carolina guy, Alex, like he's, he's an agent. He has a handful of rental properties. Um, I, I sent an offer out on this one like four months, three or four months ago. Um, just someone needed help and they brought the lead to me. Then the guy ghosted us. And then all of a sudden he came back and he's like, I still haven't sold my place. And, uh, but then he's telling me, well, I want X amount down because I could just wrap this to a homestead buyer for a 45 K down payment and make a thousand dollars a month. And he's saying all this shit. And I'm like, well, why don't you just, you know, why don't you just do that where he's trying to get like 65 K out of us for, a rental that looked like it would cash flow about 400 a month um, in North Carolina and Charlotte. So it's a nice area. So we were thinking about it, but our max was like 50 K and then there were some issues with the numbers. And he's like, well, like he understood the lingo cash on cash return balloon um, silent second, like a whole bunch of stuff. So anytime we're speaking with someone like that, we're never going to get a home run deal. We still will get a, you know, we could get a deal that works and we could wholesale or whatever it is. Keep, but uh, it's definitely harder to get those killer deals when you're dealing with savvy investors. Um, but you can still make things happen as well. This deal uh, profit calculator, Benjamin, it's in the Discord. And this website, for anyone that was wondering, it's free. I think you just have to make a login now, which is unfortunate. No, but it's free. Bit. Cool. Did anyone have any questions in regards to this seller finance deal or the subject to deal? Nobody? Okay. I wanted to say one thing with that note on hey, limited oh, site. Uh, oh. Oh, go ahead, Rich. Sorry, go Jack. Ahead. So, sorry, Jack. Yeah, no, Alex, I just you said about the seller finance, the you, you could probably assign it for 15, 20 K. What how did you sort of determine that? Good question. So because it's cash flowing, this is why people are going to want it. Because it's cash flowing, and it's still like at this fourteen thousand divided by the purchase price is around four percent. And so, an investor who's buying a creative deal, a seller finance deal, would most likely be comfortable with a ten percent. This is a case by case basis location plays a role there's several things that play a role when looking at what you could sell the deal for but because it's cash flowing it's in a decent location um like crew said it people are moving there so that's good and just based off those two reasons and another thing to just say really quickly Sub two deals, people are more conservative with sub two deals than they are seller finance. I know buyers that um, I shouldn't say this exactly because I see a lot some deals posted that are seller finance with ten percent entries that don't move. But I know people personally that kind of their general rule of thumb is their sub two entries have to be less than ten percent. Their seller finance, they're willing to come up twenty percent. So I'm not saying that's always going to be the case, but I know people are less conservative with seller financing and they're willing to come up higher, closer to that 15%, sometimes even 20% down payment range, just because 
um, you don't have to worry about due on sale and and other risks with the sub two. Um, so I've I've heard that from a handful of of actually people who are even in sub two and and uh, fairly large investors that will pay more for seller finance deals versus a sub two. So that's just another thing to consider as well. Yeah. In terms of the is percentage, there, is there usually like I was gonna say is is there a percentage that you guys generally use? Um, is like a total entry. Well, I mean, honestly, we no, try not total entry, like a percentage of. I guess a percentage, yeah, uh, a percentage of the total entry price that you would then tack on as an assignment fee. Yeah. So honestly, like a seller finance, I mean, that's the thing with an assignment, you can always adjust during your marketing period. So if you're a little high, you can always come down. But I mean, if we had one, let's just use this one we're talking about, for example, it's in a growing area, decent area, not too far from Tucson. I don't think we could move it as high as we could move something in Tucson, but we could probably get away with like a a 13, 14% entry fee on this one. I think would this you... is where we would start at 39K, which is probably at that 13%. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, at the same time, you could always write the uh, assignment fees and entry fees are um, negotiable. So it's it's what you really think. Like I've seen people post some deals where it doesn't mean they ever sold, but I sometimes see people posting ridiculous entry fees and there's people saying, I'll buy it interested. I doubt they ever buy it and they have to price drop or they just get some newbie who has some money and just wants to randomly buy a property. But um, if we're trying to be, you know, strategic and, and calculated about it, I agree. Like we'd probably start there just under a 15% entry and try to move it. But let's say there was a little more cash flow than 400 a month and it was actually in Phoenix, then this is probably something where we could get away with like 16 to 18 or something like that. I feel like. Right, Alex, wouldn't you say, I feel like we could get closer, a little higher than 15% on it. I mean, you could always adjust the price. So if you aren't getting good feedback at 25 or whatever, whatever you start at, then you just adjust accordingly um, so that you do get better feedback because yeah, what people are paying for the entry fee is really important to them. So yeah. You want to make sure that they're happy with what they're paying after your assignment. And then one thing is cash on cash too, right? Because your entry fee and your monthly cash flow with your exit, that's going to create your cash on cash return. So if say an entry fee is $60,000 and it's, oh my gosh, it's 20% of the purchase price, but the monthly payment's so dang low and the rent's so dang high and it's giving you a 20% cash on cash return almost, let's say, no one cares. So if the, if the, if the cash flow is incredible, someone wouldn't really care, but that's always like kind of an exception gray area. It's pretty rare when you'll get that high of a cash on cash return with like a, a typical long-term rental exit. Um, but like, there's a guy that I talked to um, where he told me, he's like, Jack, I need, um, and unfortunately we haven't got him anything yet, but he was like, Jack, I need tax write-offs depreciation before the end of the year. I don't care about an entry fee. Just give me something that cash flows $500 plus a month entry fee, no higher than 20% sub to any major market, um, preferably Texas, Florida. Um, but those are, as you guys know, who, who've been making calls and looking at some of these numbers yourself and underwriting these 500 plus cash flow is, is, is not common at all, even with a higher entry fee than 10%. So we weren't really able to find him anything, but he was looking more so on like a cash on cash, just wanting pretty solid cash flow in a nice market. So there's going to be buyers like that too, but the general rule of thumb, like Alex and I've always stated, and like you guys have heard is most people's buy box is 10% entry or less 5% interest rate or less, but there's always exceptions. And this buyer specifically, he's looking more so at like cash on cash return in the specific market. So, because I've seen those rare exceptions too, where something cash flows a crazy amount, but the entry fee is high, but it makes sense in terms of the cash on cash return. So people will still do it. And to find cash on cash return, it's the monthly cash flow times 12, mm -hmm. right? And then divided by the entry cost. Yeah. Total cash to total cash to close. So yeah, entry fee. I guess you could you could factor in your holding costs, any repairs, things like that. Um, so your your total your total cash invested in the deal. Um so it'd be your your total income from that property in a year divided by the total entry entry meaning not just okay my cash to wholesaler my down payment like your holding costs your total cash 
your total cash you had to spend until that property was starting to pay you money. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. So um uh talking about due on sale, um you mentioned that uh like more investors uh, uh more interest in the seller, seller financing than due uh because of a due on sale. I thought that we had a way to deal with the due on sale, like a yeah. uh, needs and stuff. You do, you do. Um there's still I mean there's still risk involved with it and dealing with it, but at the same time there's people that are just more traditional investors who just prefer a straight seller finance with no risk or anything like, well, I mean, of course there's risk in every investment, but that's just general feedback that I've heard from some people. And some of these people are actually in sub two. And one of these guys I know, he has like three or 400 houses and that's, that's his thing. He doesn't really like sub twos too much and he prefers seller finance deals and he's willing to pay more. Um, and yeah, Alex and I actually had a meeting last week with Pace's attorney, Sean St. Clair, who writes up all the documents and contracts and everything like that. And, uh, for Pace and I mean, there's, there's ways to resolve due on sale super easily. Like everyone I know who it's happened to, it's been a super easy resolution in terms mm -hmm. of just deeding it back to the seller, buying it on a lease option, um, putting it in a trust, sometimes just calling the bank and saying, Hey, this is what we did. I'm a credible buyer. Here's my proof of funds and income and, I could easily handle these payments. We've been making the payments for the last two years. No problem. Like mm -hmm. that's the general census. And that's what everyone said. That's what Pace has said. And it totally works and it hasn't been an issue, but there are other people like this other guy I know who, who has been in the business for a long time and is, is part of sub two. He, uh, which is understandable. And some actually some Gator lenders actually, I know too, who lend a lot of money and have lent on other people's like a lot of sub two deals, they're kind of nervous now since rates have shot up substantially. Banks aren't in the greatest positions. Well, what if something kind of changes and it's no longer as easy to resolve? Or what if banks hire their own a specific department to go after these loans and try to refi them out at higher rates? But then the counter to that is, well, if banks did that, then people would just, they wouldn't necessarily refi with that same bank. So then that bank would you know, potentially lose out on any interest at all. So it might not be the smartest decision. So then I'm like, oh, I totally get that. So it's just a debate back and forth from different opinions. Um, obviously, sub two is more risky because you would have to deal with that and have to come up with a resolution. And it seems like 99% of the time you're able to resolve the due on sale clause and it's no issue at all. We've never dealt with it. I'm just speaking on um, experiences from others that I've heard um, when it's happened. So I'm not really worried about it. I don't think Alex is really worried about it either, but some people are. Mm, I see. So you guys have uh, uh, like more sub two deals or owner financing deals? We're pretty much targeting sub two deals. The owner financing deals, like the way most people come across the owner financing deals is part of the general sales process when you're doing like direct to seller stuff. Um, or I guess, yeah, for sale, well, I guess you could pitch the stuff to agents too, but not on our low equity um, listings we're calling. The mm -hmm. typical sales process is like you're you're giving a seller the low ball cash offer. Then you're you're basically, if they deny it, you're disqualifying that. And then you're pitching like a creative offer. So if their house is owned free and clear, you're usually pitching a like a seller finance. And then you pivot into like an ovation if they don't accept that. And then it's quote unquote, like a dead lead. So that's how a lot of people get seller finance deals, like when the seller denies the lowball cash offer and they say they're firm on their price, then you can say, Hey, well, I can give you your price if you're open to terms. And then you're kind of figuring out their pain point, their motivation, and then maybe giving them 20 grand in their pocket now and paying a monthly, however you structure it. So that's how a lot of people get owner finance deals. Mm -hmm. um, they're definitely not as common as the sub two deals, but they're still, you know, I still see them a, a fair amount out there. Um, yeah. Okay. But right now we're, We've mainly been doing DTA low equity stuff, but we're starting to do and just really building out everything like Alex and I have been working on CRM. Um, Alex is going to touch on this VA thing we're going to start doing soon too and building out all these workflows so we can kind of open the floodgates to start focusing more on uh, direct to seller stuff. And uh, I'm sure once that happens, we'll start seeing more owner finance opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't know if I set you up perfectly there, Alex, to going to the VA thing. Was that next on the agenda? Yeah. <laughs> um, briefly, did anyone have any questions before? Can you explain uh, what Novation is? Um, 
yeah, I'll touch on that super quick. So novation is basically just like a net listing. So essentially you're getting someone's per permission to list the property on the open market or the MLS. So essentially with the novation, um, you would think, well, why doesn't the person just want to list it with the real estate agent? Well, real estate agent negotiation, paying the real estate agent commissions, having the house on the market, just dealing with showings and things like that. Um, with the novation, basically me as an investor, I'm telling that seller, hey, you don't have to worry about real estate agents not performing. I have a huge network. I have dozens and dozens of agents I work with in that area that are top agents. Um, of course, you want to have some sort of credibility behind what you're saying too. I have a platform like we have investor lift. I have 4 million buyers nationwide. I'm going to get this in the front of tons of people's faces and we're going to get this thing sold at the price we agree upon. So I agree upon a price with that seller. And then basically I can list it on the MLS or the open market or find a buyer any way I'd like. And I can keep the net difference on top of what I was paying the seller. So that's basically just a, a quick kind of rundown of what an ovation is. And we could probably go deeper in depth into okay. that next week. Maybe with Chris. And also, we could talk about the Lubbock deal. We're closing on our yeah. first cash deal together, which will be fun. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, that one likely will be a maybe a fix and flip, or I think fix and flip. 